Since the launch of the Atari Jaguar in November of 1993, perception of the system has evolved from underdog to underachiever to abomination. A quick look at the sales figures, around just a quarter million units produced, and it's easy to see why the Atari Jaguar is often sitting near the top of every worst of console list made over the past 15 years. Atari effectively dying after the Jaguar's failure doesn't help either, but to really determine if the Jag truly is one of the worst consoles ever, one must dive into the library of games. Hardware is nothing without software, after all. While I don't own every Jag game, I do own a sizable collection, so rather than poke fun at number pads, act confused by a controller's size, laugh at exposed circuit boards, and lament on missing dust flaps, I'm just going to play some games. Cybermorph was the pack-in title for a majority of the Jaguar's lifespan. This one is a third-person space shooting game where the player takes control of a ship with the goal of collecting orbs scattered about the universe. Initially, nine planets are shown, and these can be selected in any order. Upon selection, the player is dropped onto the planet to get busy collecting. The controls are surprisingly good, and maneuvering around in 3D space is smooth and intuitive. Even the shooting is solid, and mowing down enemy ships feels better than it looks. Better still, there are multiple weapons to collect for more devastation, and even super weapons like screen nukes and nitro bursts. Combine this with a variety variety of different planets to explore with varying enemy patterns, different level geometry and bright colors, and Cybermorph seems like a decent action game, especially for 1993. Graphically, I like Cybermorph. While the low polygon count, short draw distance, and inconsistent frame rate certainly looks dated today, I do find the chunky, flat shaded models and guru shaded environments to have an understated simplicity that is reasonably appealing. Unfortunately, I find the gameplay to be pretty boring. Every time I grab this one off the shelf, my playthrough goes something like this. Play the initial nine planets on the first level, fail at a bonus stage, defeat a boss, and then arrive at level two, where nine more planets are presented, and then I shut the game off. While the open world concepts introduced were a stark contrast to a certain on-rails experience, the lack of any structure to the levels really dragged the pace of the game down. The worlds feel awfully empty without much to do or meaningful areas to explore. For all the things Cybermorph does right, like the exceptionally useful radar for example, at the end of the day, this is little more than a glorified easter egg hunt. It isn't awful, but it is underwhelming. Another game arriving in 1993 is Raiden. This is a vertically scrolling shooter, and an awesome one at that. While the Sega Genesis and Super Nintendo ports of this iconic shmup were below average at best, the Jaguar port is vastly superior. As best as I can tell, everything was created from the ground up for this port. The sprite work is terrific, with detailed structures, nice terrain, and even little details like grazing cows. The sprites do an awesome job helping the player feel like they are flying high in the air fighting aliens, rather than just a few feet off the ground over generic settings. The soundtrack is also excellent, with awesome renditions of the classic ride and tunes. Everything sounds crisp and clear, with no scratchy instruments or unnecessary reverb. The compositions are even better, and I always find myself humming many of these days after putting the controller down. The gameplay itself is a bit more mixed. At times, I feel like there is a slight delay between pressing the D-pad and my ship actually moving on the screen. The this slight delay makes it tough to evade some of the more intense bullet patterns, of which Raiden has many. I also find the bullets to be a touch too small, and the colors of incoming bullets lack contrast with the background. Maybe this is a legitimate issue, or maybe it's my own visual deficiencies, but at times the act of dodging bullets seems harder than it should be. Still, while notable, both issues are minor and most players should be able to adapt. What's left is a great shooter with two different weapons, a laser or Vulcan cannon, which can be upgraded many times for some serious screen clearing potential. The sub 
weapons are missiles, with one type firing forward and a weaker one homing in on enemies. When fully powered up with homing missiles, it can be easy to get into a nice groove with Raiden, but once you get hit, you respawn with no power-ups, which kinda sucks. Raiden is an old-school, tough-as-nails shooter that won't appeal to everyone, but if you've got a friend, clearing through the first loop shouldn't be too big of a hurdle. While not the flashiest Jaguar game available, Raiden is a unique port of the classic title and a standout game for the system. Tempest 2000 is the creation of the legendary code ninja Jeff Minter. This one debuted somewhat early in the Jag's lifespan in April of 1994 and does a great job showing off what the Jaguar was capable of in the hands of an ambitious programmer. At its core, the gameplay of Tempest 2000 is reminiscent of single-screen spaceship shooters of the early 1980s. However, instead of enemies invading from a flat perspective, they invade from the opposite side of 3D webs. While the core mechanics are effectively the same, the addition of the third dimension is a great update to the classic formula. Of course, there are plenty of other upgrades as well, such as power-ups giving the ability to jump, increased firepower, and even zapping lasers. Unfortunately, after about 10 or so levels, Tempest 2000 demands more skill than I actually possess, and no matter how many hours I sink into this one, I'm still rubbish at it. Some of this may be the game's fault, as it does try to cram a lot of wireframe objects into the distance, and on the low-res hardware, it ends up looking a little pixelated and a touch confusing. Other are able to adapt, of course, but for me, the struggle is real. While elements of the gameplay elude me, the graphics do not. This game is gorgeous. Pixel effects are used to create all sorts of special effects all over the screen. Neater still, wireframes and sprites will melt into each other, creating some of the most unique effects I've seen in the era. All of this wizardry will cause the frame rate to stumble at times, but not enough to hamper the gameplay. Finally, the soundtrack is stunning. The main music track is a half-techno, half-rave mix, and the insane pace and strange synth sounds match perfectly with the 3D wireframe visuals and general chaos happening on the screen at nearly all times. Add in some goofy voice samples and you've got something really special. Tempest 2000 was so well received it would also be ported to both the PlayStation and the Saturn. Your mileage may vary of course, maybe the gameplay will suck you in or maybe it won't. In either case, just about anyone can appreciate the insanity of the flashy visuals, raving soundtrack and simple yet deep gameplay. Alien vs. Predator is a first-person shooter developed by Rebellion and released in October of 1994. Being an exclusive and having an awesome license, Alien vs. Predator was a big deal back in 1994. Even these days, Alien vs. Predator is often noted as being a bright spot in the JAG's limited library. At the start of the adventure, the player is given the choice to play as the Colonial Marine, an alien, or a predator. The gameplay is similar between the three characters, but abilities and objectives do vary. The Marine is the most straightforward, with the ultimate goal being to simply survive and escape while being hunted by aliens and predators. Though a touch slow, the controls feel accurate and blasting creatures is satisfying. The Predator strays from the formula with the goal of hunting down the alien queen and adds an honor system to the mix. While cloaked, enemies cannot see you, but you need to reveal yourself before killing to gain honor points. By earning honor points, the player gains access to new weapons. Killing while cloaked removes honor points, resulting in a loss of weapons. Finally, the alien has three attacks, slashing with the claws, biting with the jaws, and whipping with the tail. Cooler still, you can cocoon marines. This means upon death, the action is resumed from the last cocoon. Unfortunately, Alien vs. Predator's gameplay is extremely sloppy. When playing as the marine, you're often forced to kill aliens in small hallways and corridors, meaning you are forced to take damage as you walk over their ass. Acid blood. Ammo is limited as well, so at times you're just boned. I also found the Predator's first attack to be very hit or miss. Sometimes you'll land hits with a satisfying slashing sound, and other times nothing happens. You just sit there and take damage while desperately trying to find the sweet spot to land a hit. 
To make matters worse, the level design is awful. Instead of thoughtful maps, each level is a grid-based maze. Everything looks the same, dead ends are frequent, and it's never clear when the player is making progress towards a goal, and when one is just wasting resources. The poor maps and questionable gameplay make for a game that hasn't aged well. The frame rate doesn't help either, churning along at 7 to 9 frames per second at all times. This might have been impressive in 1994, but in 2017, it feels half-baked. Doom needs no introduction, so let's get right to the Atari Jaguar port. This was programmed by John Carmack himself, and based on what you can see on the screen, the man seemed hell bent on pushing the Jaguar hardware to its limits. The result is a great version of the classic Doom. While the resolution is somewhat low, with the horizontal resolution effectively halved to keep the frame rate acceptable, it still looks great on a CRT, and even here in upscaled RGB. The main reason for this is the lighting, with the areas immediately in front of the player being bright and the background fading off into near nothingness. It's a great effect and really pushes the ray casting engine over the top. While visually stunning, the gameplay is a bit less so. Again, I feel like there is a slight delay with the controls, and making pinpoint adjustments to your aim is nearly impossible. With enough practice, many of these can be mitigated, but I always felt like my strafing was a step behind the action. After adjusting to the limitations, Doom remains every bit as fun as ever. While a little delayed, accuracy is never an issue, and laying waste to the monsters and demons found in the world is still a fun experience. The level design also holds up remarkably well. Flipping switches, locating key cards, and opening doors lead to brand new areas and a ton of secrets. Sometimes just making it to an arbitrary point in the map will cause a piece of the level to shift, showing you the way forward through the map. While not as complete as the original game, the level design here in Jag Doom is still exceptional and way ahead of many games being released today. And when compared to Alien vs Predator, well, there is no comparison. Sadly, the awesome Doom soundtrack doesn't play during the game. While it was created and plays between the levels, it doesn't actually play during the gameplay. Some claim this adds to the atmosphere, but I'm not a Jaguar apologist. The rock-inspired soundtrack is most definitely part of the Doom experience, and it kinda stinks it isn't here. Soundtrack aside, Doom on the Jaguar is an awesome game, showing off the computational power of the console and being a total blast to boot. Another game out in time for the holidays in 1994 was Checkered Flag. While sharing the same name as an Atari Lynx title, Checkered Flag for the Jaguar was developed by Rebellion and has nothing in common with the portable racer. Instead, this one seems inspired by Sega's Virtual Racing. Unlike Virtual Racing, Checkered Flag is dreadful. Though I do like the simple flat-shaded graphics, the frame rate is poor, often resembling a slideshow rather than a full-fledged video game. Next, the controls are abysmal. One would be lucky just to make it around the course without flipping, let alone do it with any sort of proficiency. The main problem is the broken steering, and it is way too easy to smash into the sides of the course as the race car accelerates from side to side. Making small adjustments is just not possible. Zooming the camera way out does make the game slightly less awful, but racing in helicopter view is a sorry excuse for proper controls. Stranger still, the AI drones will just stop in the middle of the race courses for no reason whatsoever. These tracks are as basic as it gets as well, with simple layouts, minimal elevation changes, and a lack of variety with the turns, so I'm not really sure what is confusing them. The soundtrack is the highlight, though strictly average for sure, but the engine note is a bit muffled and doesn't really scream race car. Atari really needed a home run for Christmas 1994. Instead, Checkered Flag looks distinctly worse than offerings on the competing 32X and 3DO consoles. For my money, Checkered Flag is one of the absolute worst video games ever made, and I recommend avoiding it like the plague. Zoom. 
Zool 2 is a platformer developed by Gremlin, and though released on DOS and Amiga platforms, it never made it to the Genesis or Super Nintendo, making the Jaguar version somewhat special. On the surface, this is a decent platformer. The main characters move fast, have jumping spin attacks as well as projectile attacks. Level variety is high, with bright vibrant worlds to traverse through, and the sound is, as expected, excellent. I love all the goofy sound samples placed throughout the opening piece, and the modern take on ancient Egypt is a wonderful composition really setting the mood of the stage. There are even great level gimmicks, like a plethora of breakable walls, often containing bonus lives and tons of collectibles. The collectibles are needed too, as the player cannot exit at the stage without the collection meter reaching 99. I also loved these hidden platforms leading to secret areas or revealing hidden platforms needed to perform the backflip. Finally, the bosses are decent with fun patterns to avoid and dodge. They do seem to take longer than necessary to defeat, but compared to similar titles of the time, they are above average. All of this is for naught, however, as the enemy placement found in Zool 2 is some of the worst I've ever experienced in a platformer. Everything is chaotic, in a bad way, and there is little rhyme or reason to the location of any enemy. This means the least risky means of travel is to constantly do the spin jump, which wipes out a majority of the enemies in the game world, but not all, like these little shelled enemies. This does make platforming more difficult than necessary. The player is constantly bouncing around, unable to plan for what's ahead because the screen is constantly littered with stuff. There is no way around it. It's a shame too, because I like the bright colored world worlds, and the overall aesthetic feels a lot different than other platformers of the time. It's enough to make me want to progress forward, but I always run out of lives around the halfway point of the adventure. Zool 2 could have been a great game with some design tweaks. Instead, it's a great sounding, decent looking, poor playing platformer, released at a time when the market was already oversaturated with such titles. Iron Soldier is another high-profile release and was popular enough to spawn an entire trilogy. The game puts you inside a giant mech, an Iron Soldier, and then presents a bunch of missions to complete. The first is rather straightforward. Simply progress through the level and destroy buildings. Along the way, the player will shoot helicopters and tanks, smash down buildings, and is given a lot of freedom to wreak havoc in enemy territory. Despite the simplistic graphics, Iron Soldier is a visually appealing game. The flat shaded graphics give the futuristic world a very clean look, and there are a few textures on enemies and a couple of buildings to show the Jaguar was capable of more than flat and guru shaded polygons. The frame rate is surprisingly smooth as well, and combined with the decent draw distances, this is a clear leap ahead of Cybermorph. It even accomplishes all of this with the soundtrack playing in the background, mixing 60s spy music with 80s electronica. For its time, the presentation was very good. Unfortunately, I find the game a bit tedious. While Mission 1 is straightforward and offers the player a lot of freedom, Mission 2 takes most of this away. The player is tasked with destroying two ships before they leave port, meaning this is a timed level. While on a strict timer, the player needs to find where the two ships are, and then figure out which buildings need to be smashed revealing the grenade ammo. Taking down the first ship is easy enough, but trial and erring your way through the rest of the mission and finding the ammo pickups, failing and restarting kinda sucks. Once you learn everything, the stage can be cleared in just a couple of minutes, but the 40 minute journey to get there is not very fun. By the time I get to mission 3, I've usually had my fill and I never feel compelled to spend another 40 minutes learning the location of all of the power ups needed to destroy the bridges. Your tastes may vary, but the slow plotting pace and trial and error nature of the gameplay mitigates the solid presentation and precise controls. With Val de Seer skiing and snowboarding, we arrive at 1995. As the title suggests, this is a skiing and snowboarding game, just before snowboarding and other extreme sports were about to dominate gaming in the late 90s. Rather than polygons, however, Val de Seer relies on the classic line scrolling and sprite scaling techniques to generate the slopes. My favorite mode is the free ride. The player picks a starting point and then tries to reach the end of the run. If successful, more areas of the mountain are unlocked. There's also a slalom event, requiring the player to quickly navigate left and right between flags, and competition modes where you need to score fast times to progress through the next events. 
but like many Jaguar games, Veldasir has some polish issues. Though responsive, the controls are weird. At times, the slope will automatically bend left and right, requiring zero input from the player. Other times, input is needed to make it around a bend. And because bumps in the slope basically obscure any upcoming obstacles, it can be difficult or impossible to see what is ahead and plan your path. The result is a ton of falling, which is enough to turn off many players. Despite containing both skis and snowboards, the changes are purely cosmetic, and both forms of transport, as far as I can tell, control exactly the same, further limiting the variety. I really wish Virtual Studio had spent some more time fleshing out the gameplay, because the game engine here is impressive. The controls are responsive, the frame rate never dips from 60 frames per second, and the sprite scaling is some of the smoothest I've seen on a home console. Sadly, the gameplay is just average. If you're not adverse to memorizing dozens of different snow tracks to mitigate the massive amount of surprise obstructions, you might find some real enjoyment. For everyone else, once the marvel of the graphics wears off, what's left is mediocre. Next up is Hover Strike. As you can no doubt see, this is a fully textured polygon game, a rarity on the JAG. On the surface, this appears to be a generic tank style game, but the hover in Hover Strike should be taken literally. The developers actually managed to mimic the physics of a hovercraft. It's a bit bizarre, but oddly accurate, and sliding around the worlds is surprisingly fun. The missions themselves are far more vanilla. Much like Cybermorph, there is little here to hold one's attention. In each mission, you just need to take out a specific number of targets outlined in the mission screen. In the game world, these are large icons on the radar. Simply race towards the target, take down some enemies, snake some power-ups, and destroy the targets. As best as I can tell, this is pretty much the game. The game's 3D engine is impressive, but these planets contain vast areas of not much, and it seems like the different targets should be placed much closer together, making for more engaging battles. As is, there feels like a lot of padding. I should mention one of the planets is not textured, but exchanges textures for real-time lighting. As you fire shots, those shots act like flares and light up the world. The limited visibility isn't great from a gameplay standpoint, but kudos to the developers for implementing real-time lighting into the 3D game world. Outside of the technical aspects of Hover Strike and the unique hover controls, this one is bare bones. On the flip side, there isn't really anything offensive about it either. While it's easy to poke fun at Checkered Flag and Cybermorph, Hover Strike ends up seeming pretty tame. Super Burnout is an old-school third-person racing game from the French company Shen Technologies. Inspired by Sega's Super Scroller games from the 80s, Super Burnout is a clear nod to Yu Suzuki's Hang-On, but rather than fantasy locales to race through, Super Burnout powers circuits from across the globe. The result is a game that feels drastically different despite a similar concept. The heart of Super Burnout is a championship mode through all of the game's eight courses. You'll have the opportunity to select one of a half dozen fantasy bikes with varying grip, acceleration, and top speed. Selecting a faster bike is generally the preferred way to go, but the reduced grip means you'll often find yourself in barriers. Slower bikes can alleviate the issue, but they of course lack high-end speed. There Therefore, regardless of which bike is chosen, chances are you won't be able to win every single race as each track is better suited for different bikes. And the tracks are where Super Burnout truly excels. Despite being an entirely sprite-based racer, the tracks feel like actual locations in 3D space. And because of this, it becomes a real treat to memorize the courses, coming to grips with the excellent controls, and finally putting it all together and racing against opponents. This of course means arcade junkies might be put off by the overall presentation, but as a fan of more simulation style games, I absolutely love the feel and flow of the game. I have yet to play a line-scrolling racer that feels this responsive, nor features such predictable grip, and it blows my mind this is basically an independent game coded in a bedroom. More impressive than the smooth controls and tight track design is the visuals. Super Burnout is a gorgeous game, running at 60 frames per second without a hiccup, and the sense of speed is unmatched by anything else of the time. It doesn't skip on details either, and I dig how many courses feature a time change from night to day or day to night 
night. Lights will even go on in the buildings in the background, which is awesome. About the only thing I don't like is the headlight, which flickers every frame rather than being a transparent light. Other than that, the graphics are flawless. The audio is terrific as well, with a clear announcer and some wonderful synthesized rock tracks, sounding like an awesome marriage of an 80s movie soundtrack and 80s chip tunes. Super Burnout is also a Jaguar exclusive, and for me, the reason to own a Jaguar. It really is that good. Rayman is an oddity on the Jaguar, released either a week before the North American PlayStation launch or the same day, depending on who you believe. In any case, as you would expect from a franchise that lives on to this day, Rayman on the Atari Jaguar is absolutely amazing. Rayman himself is limbless, allowing for some intricate animations, of which the game is absolutely jam-packed with. Not only does Rayman move with a fluidity unmatched for the time, the backgrounds are equally beautiful, with a hand-painted appearance taking advantage of the increased color capabilities of the hardware. The result is a stunning looking game showing there was still life left for hand-drawn sprites. The soundtrack is also fantastic, though obviously different than the CD versions on later systems. While not Redbook Audio, the chiptunes mostly contain the same compositions from the CD versions, along with similar instrument arrangements. While not as full or rich, I am a sucker for chiptunes and I enjoy these very much. But presentation aside, it's the gameplay that really matters. Rayman also excels here, with precise jumping and no collision issues at all. The game is also thoughtfully crafted, slowly giving Rayman more abilities to conquer new challenges, and giving incentive to revisit earlier levels to locate areas now accessible with the new moves. However, I must say this game is brutally difficult. At times, the tasks required of the player seem insane. I would say the difficulty relies more on tricky platforming and tough patterns than trial and error, however. Still, don't expect to beat this game in an hour or two. It's a massive game with huge levels and a ton of challenge. While the PlayStation port is probably the go-to version simply because of the massive price disparity, the Jaguar version gives a glimpse into the 2D potential of the Atari Jaguar in the hands of a AAA development team. Before we move on, I just want to take a brief moment to recognize where we are on the Atari Jaguar's timeline. The rest of the games in this video were released after the Sony PlayStation and Sega Saturn were available in the North American market. Power Drive Rally was developed by Rage Software and is a sequel to Power Drive. Unlike the first game, Power Drive Rally is a Jaguar exclusive. To the best of my knowledge, this is also the only Jaguar game to have different box art depending on the region. As you can see here, this is a top-down overhead racer, though it has some isometric nods to it as well. The heart of the game is a grueling championship mode, taking the player all over the world, competing in different events. Sometimes this is a race against the clock other times against an opponent, and other times you're presented with a driving challenge, testing your ability to navigate in reverse and avoid traffic cones. While a bit primitive for a 1995 release, Power Drive Rally works perfectly as a retro game. The controls are twitchy, in a good way. The AI drone puts up a decent fight, the tracks are lengthy but not unwieldy, meaning it can be quick to memorize a course after a few tries. Thankfully, you can save after every victory, allowing for infinite continues. Events happen quickly as well, generally between 3-5 to five minutes, which is in the sweet spot for this type of game. While lacking polygons or the detail of other top-down rally racers of the time, I do appreciate how the frame rate hums along at 60 frames per second, giving a nice sense of speed and really aiding in the control department. The sprite work is also good, with color and detail falling somewhere between a Super Nintendo and a Neo Geo. There are even transparencies, simulating shadows, both on the rally cars and background objects. The soundtrack is a bit generic, but does a decent job serving as unobtrusive background music. The engine notes are also sort of adorable, sounding like toy versions of the licensed cars. While Power Drive Rally isn't really what the Atari Jaguar needed coming into its first holiday season against the next-gen consoles, it proves to be a good racing game on par with something like RC Pro-Am, and there is nothing wrong with that.
Pitfall the Mayan Adventure is a side-scrolling platformer starring Pitfall Harry Jr. I guess this could probably be considered an action game, but I find the overall aesthetic and gameplay design to be more in line with the Disney games released in the early to mid-90s. The drill here is pretty familiar. The default weapon is a whip, which acts as a melee weapon. You can also collect power-ups, giving you limited ranged attacks. Harry Jr. can jump, run, and army crawl over or through obstacles. There are also ropes to climb and timing-based platforms. In all honesty, there is virtually nothing here that hadn't already been done years before. About the only unique thing is how some areas have multiple layers, so you can move along on a background layer, for example. It's neat and gives the game a bit of personality, but it is minor. I should also note this was ported not by Activision, but by Imagitech Design. Those folks also ported Raiden, which runs at 30 frames per second and has slightly laggy controls. I mention this because Pitfall the Mayan Adventure is the same way. The game is a bit choppy and the controls are a little laggy. While this is somewhat mitigated in Raiden, being both a better game and a different genre, allowing for anticipation to mask some flaws, I can't say the same about Pitfall the Mayan Adventure. Enemy placement is poor, with surprise enemies eating away at the life bar. The whip is at times useless, either not registering a hit, or not having a range matching enemy placement on the levels. The bosses are aggravating as well, featuring quick moving animals, but the poor control is not keeping pace. The result is a game I find unsatisfying. I've also played this on the Sega 32X and Super Nintendo, and it wasn't a fan either, but the additional quirks of this jagport make it even worse. Some like this game, of course course, but there is just too much trial and error gameplay for me to recommend in 2017. On the flip side, the original Pitfall is presented as a bonus level, which is kinda cool. Atari on the Atari. Runer Pinball is a pinball game from High Voltage, and another exclusive for the JAG. Oddly enough, this along with Kirby's Pinball Land is what got me into the digital pinball genre. There are two tables, Runer and Tower, and both are designed in a way where a beginner can keep their ball in play for extended periods of time, allowing a new player to learn the tables and start to understand the different modes. Unfortunately, I'm not sure there is much here for the hardcore fan. The biggest issue is the flippers and their interaction with the pinball. It can be nearly impossible to hit certain ramps and shots. I understand how the tables work and how to make my way up the board, but something about the way the flipper interacts with the pinball is a little off. It's unfortunate too because I actually enjoy both tables. Tower has a really neat medieval horror theme complete with eyeballs, monsters, and a dragon. The game also strays away from realism with different elements that can only exist in digital form. Same goes for the Runer table, with a 50s Cold War theme. Instead of being three screens tall, this one is two screens tall and two screens wide. But again, navigating to different areas trying to reach targets proves problematic. It is possible to rack up some big scores and of course multi-ball, but at times this feels more like luck than skill. The graphics suffer a similar fate. I love the bright detailed graphics, and this truly does feel like a step up from the 16-bit consoles in sheer detail. There are even scaling and rotation effects littered throughout, and it looks great. But the frame rate is all over the map, hovering between 30 frames and 60 frames per second. The sound is solid as well. The background music is subtle and bassy. A nice music bed for the sound effects, which are excellent. The pinball makes all sorts of different noises when interacting with the table. The bright sound effects work really well with the background music to create a truly pleasing experience. While failing at being an excellent pinball game, Runer Pinball is a fun game for sure and is a decent addition to the Jaguar library. Supercross 3D is another one of those games that gives the Jaguar a bad reputation. It was developed by Tiertex, who had a history of questionable Game Boy ports. I do have to give them credit for their ambition, and I like the idea of a 3D Supercross game with actual dirt textures and sprite-based racers. It seems like just the thing the Atari Jaguar could excel at. Sadly, this game looks a mess. Whenever there are more than a few riders on the screen, the frame rate dips into the single digits. It does get better when flying solo in first place, but it's still pretty poor. 
However, what really drags the game down is what happens when the player goes off course. The rider falls every time, no matter what. The learning curve in Supercross 3D is steep, and Tier Text really should have come up with a better solution to off-track stumbles. Still, once you get a grip on the controls, Supercross 3D isn't awful. I actually cruise to many victories thanks to the tight controls. Since every turn in the entire game is the same short right angle, it becomes very easy to anticipate when to turn in and when to stop turning, even when the frame rate chugs along. The developers even created a basic trick system, though it doesn't seem to actually do anything. You can also load up the suspension and get some serious air, which aids in maneuvering through the later circuits. Don't get me wrong though, Supercross 3D is not a good game. It just happens to not be utterly broken, like Checkered Flag. If the frame rate was smoother and the off-course issues not so annoying, this one could have been a competent game. Unfortunately, this one shipped in pretty rough shape. As we near the end of the Jags life cycle, we arrive at Atari Karts. This is a Mario Kart clone developed by Miracle Designs. As a Mario Kart clone, this one fails in nearly every way. For one, the tracks are way too short, often taking less than 30 seconds per lap. Next, there are virtually no offensive weapons to speak of, though in multiplayer you can reverse your opponent's steering, which is weak sauce. There's also no battle mode or any other goodies. Basically, in most ways, Atari Karts misses many of the key ingredients making Super Mario Kart so great, especially to non-racing fans. Omissions aside, Atari Karts is still fairly good. For starters, the controls are excellent. In many Mode 7 style games, I often feel I'm rotating the background rather than steering the vehicle. In Atari Karts, you actually feel like you are controlling the cart, not the background, which is nice. You can also enable hills, further enhancing the 3D effect. While Atari Karts lacks many cool power-ups, there are plenty of things to aid in the racing. Littered around the circuits are rabbits, which speed up the cart, turtles, which which slow it down and should be avoided, steering wheels which reduce friction allowing the player to not spin out, and wheels which allow the player to race outside the track without slowing down. There are also reverse items which reverse your own steering which is awfully annoying. Also annoying is getting stuck on walls and other hazards. Rather than ricocheting off or slowing down, the carts will stop and escaping these hazards can be extremely awkward. Graphically, however, Atari Karts is fantastic. The frame rate never drops from 60 frames per second, even in two-player mode, and the track surface detail is impressive. Add in some smooth sprite scaling effects and you have another beautiful 2D effort on the Jaguar. Wrapping up, as a racing game, Atari Karts is a lot of fun with tight controls and a ton of content to unlock, but does have some rough patches. As a kart racer, it really does miss the mark. Your personal preference will likely dictate how much you enjoy the game. A few weeks after Atari Karts, Atari would release Fight for Life, a game I no longer own, before basically going out of business in early 1996. However, the Atari Jaguar would continue to live on with telegames releasing a handful of titles before the homebrew scene finally took over. This brings us to the final game in today's video, Downfall. I'm playing this on the Jaguar CD, which is most useful for playing homebrew games. Downfall is freely available to burn yourself, with an image right on the developer's website. As for Downfall, this takes me right back to the simple days of 8-bit gaming. Most of the time, all you can do is move left and right, falling down from platform to platform, trying to avoid getting crushed by the top of the screen and not falling into the abyss at the bottom of the screen. It's insanely simple, yet in its simplicity comes an inherent addictiveness. I can literally lose hours playing this game and there is something mesmerizing and hypnotic about moving left and right as the screen steadily moves along. There are a few temporary power-ups though, including balloons slowing descent, a jetpack for flying, and finally, some sneakers allowing the player to jump. These aren't required, but can make it easier to grab tough to reach fruit, which reward a ton of points. Yeah, points. That's what Downfall is, a chase for points. 
Like I said, this absolutely reminds me of an old endless Atari game, so it's fitting it was released for Atari's final system. The music on the other hand is pure 90s. The driving techno beats with piano notes sound fantastic and match the fast scrolling background. There are also synthesized voices spitting out one-liners, though their frequency is thankfully restrained. And that is Downfall, easy to learn, tough to master, with an awesome soundtrack. And it's free. Are we there yet? So, after looking at 18 Atari Jaguar games, let me offer my closing thoughts. First, as much as I enjoy the Jag, it isn't hard to see the library doesn't stack up to the consoles it was meant to leapfrog, that being the Sega Genesis and Super Nintendo. While it's clear the system has superior graphical and audio capabilities, the system failed to attract the best developers in the industry, leaving the system with few marquee games. And of course, it also fails in comparison to the PlayStation, Saturn, and N64. The transition to 3D was a rocky one for sure, and it's obvious in 1993 and 1994, the developers that did give the Jaguar a chance weren't able to create the types of experiences that would later define the fifth generation of video games. However, there were some small teams that were able to create some good 2D games. Exclusives like Runer Pinball and Val de Seer Skiing and Snowboarding are flawed for sure, but also interesting. Interesting. Atari Karts and Power Drive Rally are solid racing games and again only available on the JAG. And then there is Super Burnout, one of the finest arcade style motorcycle racers I've ever played. It's hard to believe the original developers haven't ported this to iOS or Android so the rest of the world can experience its brilliance. Instead, it remains an obscure little racer for an obscure little system. Finally, games like Iron Soldier, Tempest 2000, and Rayman would live on and receive sequels on future platforms. While the Atari Jaguar will probably always live in infamy for its plethora of lackluster polygon games like Cybermorph and Checkered Flag, the library is much better than these titles represent. Make no mistake about it, the Jaguar library is small and filled with stinkers, but there are also some real gems in here. The Jag was a failure for sure, but one of the worst game consoles ever? The games suggest otherwise.